Hey, welcome back to another episode of Shop Talk, where I show you random clips out of my shop that are not worth a separate video. This time we have quite an interesting alignment problem on a fairly long shaft. I show you a very short demonstration on thermal growth. Also, we have a old brochure from Frutic Deckel about their milling machine lineup that we will take a look at. And finally, I had to turn a huge 400 millimeter radius shape into a bunch of parts and I came up with a, as I think, pretty good solution, which was not my invention. I think I saw this in a very old machinist book, but I adapted the process for these parts and I was quite happy how they came out. So let's get started. Let's say you have a, a shaft to a machine that's about a meter long in this case, a titanium shaft, and you have features on both ends that need to be aligned to each other but can hardly be indi indicated directly. In this case it's a spline drive, a 45 tooth spline drive on both ends of this shaft and I want them to be clocked to each other. In reality it's probably it doesn't matter for what this is, but well, let's do it properly. <laughs> so the trick is to create some geometry, some temporary geometry that you can indicate on and that's what I did. So I have a spline drive down here and I took two one millimeter pins, or drills in this case, and put them in opposite grooves of the spline drive. Then I took a parallel. Well, the, the two drills are held in place with a rubber band, just temporarily. And then I took a toolmaker's clamp to hold them firmly in place. Then a parallel and some super glue. Add the super glue and push the parallel up against the two pins carefully so you don't push them out of the grooves. Then you have geometry that's in line with the spline geometry that you can indicate on. It's of course a little bit flexible so you have to be careful but for what we're doing here this is more than adequate I would say. I already aligned it. And now I'm able to cut the same spline drive on the other end of the shaft clocked to this one. A very simple way of doing it and now that that's aligned I can I can take off the indicator, take off the clamp, move the drill bit, and snap off the parallel. finish milling the profile, the cutter leaves a little bit of a burr on both sides of the spline groove. So we take some 180 grit emery cloth and we just remove those burrs. Here 
you you basically feel once you have the burrs removed when the emery cloth starts to to slide over the the lands of the now we take compressed air and blow all the abrasive grit towards the machine of course almost we're taking a rag okay i think that's oh <laughs> Uh, that's that's an extremely nice sliding fit. It's very tight. It doesn't need a hammer to be mounted. Well, probably after it has been sit after it had been assembled for years. <coughs> okay, uh, let's put this over here so I don't slice myself open on the end mill. Okay, I'm gonna leave the fit like that because when I do a little bit more deburring and polishing on this, it will loosen up, I think. But so far, I'm extremely happy. I think that's what the, the customer was after, an extremely close fit without much play. Now when you put the, the lock screw in, you don't have to tighten the everlasting crap out of the screw to get a tight fit. <coughs> the cutter that I was using for the spline is a modular head system. I think this is from Mimatic and it's called Polymill. Poly because they have a polygon interface for centering for centering the cutting heads and also for for transferring the torque there are many manufacturers of these modular head systems where you just buy a tooling shank and then you mount different cutting heads onto it uh, Mimadi is one p horn is one iscar has a similar system sandwich has a system like that um, they all have in common that they are absolutely proprietary and not compa compatible to each other and also they are very expensive and usually they work very well. You can get all kinds of shapes of cutting heads for these. Here is a 90 degree V-groove cutter and this is a, a 1.5 millimeter pitch thread milling head. So if I want to do a full profile thread mill, 1.5 millimeter pitch, that's the cutter to use. The shank of this one is slightly damaged and I had to do some <laughs> polishing on the polygon shape on the inside to get it working again, but it's nice. But personally, I will not buy any more of these because I'm using the, uh, the system. Uh, P horn. Uh, 306 system. I have a one millimeter slitting cutter in it currently and this system uses instead of the polygon shape they use three conical features on the cutting heads and the the shank has the the opposite shape uh, also a very nice system works extremely well this cutting head has done a ton of slits in 304 stainless and still like new the only thing that worries me about the system is the tiny insert screw but so far that hasn't that has not given me any trouble so these modular systems are really nice and also they are nice expensive from time to time I talk about thermal growth in parts and machines and many people might think yeah that doesn't that doesn't really cause a problem for me but even on a simple part like I'm making here this is seriously just a stepped bolt where the shoulder length is tolerance to plus minus 0.05 millimeter 50 microns 
the heat input from roughing can be a problem. So uh, let, me, let me demonstrate. I have a CNMG insert here for roughing. And we're going to remove most of the material. This part is now at the point where I basically cannot touch it anymore without hurting myself. And now I'm going to take an indicator and place the needle against the face of the part. Because I noticed recently that... Because I want to show you how much the part grows and shrinks from heat input from roughing. I'm zeroing out the, the dial, giving it good preload. It started out at zero. So the part is down to room temperature. And as you can see on the dial test indicator, we went from zero to minus 40 microns. Just from a simple roughing operation, Granted, I did a dry cut and a fairly aggressive feed and I put a lot of heat in it, but that are things that will happen. And even that was enough to change the length of the part by 40 microns. And that's very close to the maximum tolerance of the shoulder length of this part already. So if I don't pay a little bit of attention on, on my thermal management, it's easy to blow the tolerances on a super simple stepped bolt like this just because you put in a ton of heat due to roughing. Ideally I would run flood coolant but I dislike the mess of flood coolant so much. But that would be ideal to keep the temperature down of the material down and keep everything at a equal-ish temperature. You still will heat up the part and the coolant also will heat up but it's way more subtle than dry machining steel. I had the same problem when I'm making these ring mirrors. The shoulder length here is tolerance, I think, plus 50 micron minus nothing. And when I rough them out, they, they heat up quite a bit. And aluminum is, has a larger coefficient of expansion due to heat I think it's three times higher than steel and it's very noticeable even on a very short part like this so take take thermal thermal management into account when you do precision work or with everything you do basically this is a super simple part and it would be very easy to mess it up just by rough it out and then go to the finishing tool right away and the shoulder length would be off. Of course you can instead of use... Uh, so instead of coolant of course you can also use cutting oil. It's also helping with thermal management. It's reducing the friction between the cutting edge and the material and also it's pulling away some of the heat in form of burning off. Way less efficient in that regard than water-based coolants, but also way less of a mess. Also less prone to create rust on machines. And uh, there are so many problems with all kinds of coolant. All of them have big problems, but I think water-based coolant is the most terrible stuff you can use. So that's that. 
over the last years and especially the recent time since I have the Deckel milling machine, I was always collecting Deckel brochures, literature, manuals and things that go along with that. And also viewers have sent me, which is really very nice, they sent me a lot of paperwork about Deckel and I think it's a good idea to share a little bit of it here on the channel. So. Deckel always had this weird thing of never printing a date on any of their publications. This is their brochure of machine lineup, which says uh, precision experience and success since 60 years. 60 years, the company was founded in 1903, I think. So this is out of the 60s, 1960, roughly. Uh, that's their famous building in Munich. You can find on the internet pictures of the Friedrich Deckel plant in Munich and it's a gorgeous building. It's a very wide spanning, free spanning uh, industrial building. Uh, do some uh, Google image search on pictures. You will find some and it's, it's a really nice building and I think it's still up to this day. So let's see. Uh, we start with some pictures out of productions. This looks like the inspection for the LKB and LKS jig borer and jig grinder. We see some conventional inspection back here with dial indicators, test bars and things like that. And in front here, sorry about the glare, in front here is something that looks very much like an auto collimator checking probably straightness of the axis. Over here, this is, uh, <laughs> this is a very famous picture. This is assembly of the Deckel FP1 milling machine. We have the FP1s tilted on their back on these kind of flimsy chairs. And the guys seem to be assembling the knee assembly, putting all together. And there are rows and rows of machine to the back, which is, this is quite impressive. This was, these were the heydays of, of Deckel. Um, we will see that in their lineup in a second. Also we have some, uh, this is their applications workshop and also where they did training, training and applications. You could come with a weird complicated problem and they will find a solution for you. So here is their complete lineup, milling machines, stationary table milling machines, plum cutter grinders, engravers, die sinkers, the chick bore and chick grinder and a digital control, <laughs> well, numerical controlled chick bore. So let's see. This is this is quite a nice uh, brochure. We have the uh, Universal Werkzeugfräse machine, which is universal tool room milling machines. We have the FP1, which is my milling machine. A very common machine in Germany is the FP2. The Once the FP2 came out, this almost became the standard machine because the travels of the FP1 are a little bit on the small side for general tool room use. And the FP2 in its later version with 400 by 200 millimeters in XY is quite a bit more capable. The early FP2s were also available with 500 millimeters in X, but those were phased out one, once the FP3 came along, which had also 500 millimeter travel. Um, also on the older FP2 machines, the motor was inside a casting, which they stopped doing because the heat of the motor uh, warmed up the entire casting of the machine and caused a little bit of trouble as it seemed. FP3, which is basically just an up uh, size up from the FP2. Uh, both of these machines not only have a quill on the vertical head, but they also have a horizontal spindle with a quill. So you can use them excellently as a horizontal boring machine. Also, these two machines already have full power feeds in all three axes and a rapid traverse with this funny long lever here that you can pull and then the machine moves with rapid traverse. Personally, I have used 
uh, FP1, 2 and 3. That's the three machine sizes I have used personally. The 3 is already a little bit cumbersome if you do small work, so uh, buyer be aware. Then we have, uh, this is kind of a rare beast, the manual FP4. You don't see those very often. They are really, they look very clunky. I, I played at, at a machinery dealer on one of them and uh, it's a large machine, probably super rigid. They ditched the quill on this machine. The horizontal spindle quill. Then it gets really funky. Uh, these are <laughs> these are the long travel machines basically. The FP3L, this entire block here, this is stationary and it's sitting on the floor and the column with the y-axis moves along in the x-axis and in C and you have the RAM moving on top of this whole construction. Uh, these were machines with very long x-axis travel. This machine has 800 millimeters. They were considered less rigid than the, for example, the FP3 in the standard configuration, but the long travel made up for that. Also on, the, on these machines you could also extend the head out, which you could also do on the on the FP4, FP3 and on the FP2 if you had the long reach head which is not shown here. And you could also do it on the FP1 if you had the high speed head. You can extend that out too. So many options. <laughs> so uh, these are weird beasts but people seem to like them if they use them. Funky machine. Uh, they also made them in a very obscure precision variant. Uh, Genauigkeitsbohrmaschine FP3LG, which you will find pretty much no paperwork whatsoever. <laughs> uh, we have the FP33, which is a complete beast of a machine. This again has a different kinematic layout. Oh, let's pull it down. So you have a slanted x-axis. So this block here sits on the floor and you have an, uh, a tilted x-axis so the table moves in the x-direction. This whole block here moves in the z-axis up and down <laughs> and then you have uh, as standard with these machines the y-axis moving in and out. This machine is not 40 taper. All the other machines are 40 taper spindles. This one is 50 taper, weighs in at 5 tons and comes with its own crane. To be honest, the crane is a stroke of genius. All the accessories for these machines are fairly heavy. Anything above the FP2 you cannot rig without a crane. Pulling the Pulling the, the table off an FP3 is basically impossible without a crane. Even the, the box table of an FP2 is already back-breaking heavy. Oh, by the way, to give you an idea about the weight of the machine, FP1 is 700 kilograms and allows for a 200 kilogram workpiece, which is it's not too shabby. The FP2 comes in at 1.2 tons, 300 kilo workpiece, the FP3 1.5 tons, 400 kilo work piece, and the FP4 <laughs> quite impressive at two and a half tons and takes a 800 kilogram work piece. The, the FP3L only 2.5 tons but takes two tons of work on the table. This is the machine with the highest possible table load. The FP33 takes a little bit less load on the table because the table is moving in the x, di x direction. Table on this machine is completely stationary. So we have a 5 ton machine and 1.5 ton workpiece. Uh, yeah, you have the crane, you have the table and you have a bolted on extension table. Same on this machine. So you could, it ex could extend it out in the y direction. The, the, apron, the, the angled surface here also has T-slots so you can pull off the, 
the tables completely on both of these machines and bolt on accessories. The, the slant, the slanted angle slot table, of course required special accessories like adjusting angle tables because, uh, well, on all the other machines it's vertical. These are completely weird beasts of machines. And on, on this design they also made NC and CNC machines later. The FP42L, for example. So now we come into a interesting topic. These are the LKB and LKS. Jig borer and jig grinder, which are basically the same machine, but they have a different head on it. If you had a LKB, you could put on the grinding head and vice versa to make both machines do the same things. These come in at about a ton thousand kilograms and take 150 kilogram work piece. Now it's getting very old school. Engraving machines. Well, engraving and die syncing and copy millers. Uh, the G series of machines, G1L, that's the machine that I used to have. These are only two dimensional engravers and light profiling milling machines. Then we have the GK series. These are already 3D capable uh, die sinkers and copy millers. You can do 3D work with these. Knife makers and some mold people still like to use them these days, uh, but they're basically obsolete beyond. <laughs> In all honesty, they are obsolete. Then we have the KF series. These are Kopierfräsen. They are built to do one-to-one -one copy milling. There are accessories to make them do reduction and enlargement of work pieces, but mostly they are built to do one to one, one to, and also one to one copy milling of a mirror image. So they have the funky mirror image milling attachment for these. So uh, these are super interesting machines and completely obsolete. Uh, they come in at a variety of spindle options. They have a geared roughing spindle, so you can put in a shell mill. And they have belt-driven high-speed spindles and also electric high-speed spindles. And later, I think they made a air-powered high-speed spindle too. They also made a larger version, the KF2 and KF2S. The S is which what is depicted here with a servo control. Uh, this allowed for extremely heavy roughing cuts with inserted face mill and shoulder mills or large end mills. Uh, these are super cool machines, but as I said, very, very obsolete. <laughs> they come in spindle speeds from 80 up to 20,000 RPMs, so very wide range of speeds. They are very steampunk monstrosity. Very cool to look at and also to, to look through the manual, but well, it's gone. And they also made a, a version where, where the table was stationary and all the, the kinematics that did the copy milling was mounted behind the table. So you could put extremely heavy work pieces like complete mold or die sets on the table. Um, let's see if they, yeah, maximum workpiece weight 2,000 kilograms at a machine weight of 2,500 kilograms. So that's quite impressive. Let's see. Oh, okay. Here is the NC controlled. Well, I think it's tape controlled. Uh, tape controlled coordinate drilling machine. Which is funny because... Um, it allowed to do 20 positions in X and Y to be saved on this controller. And the positional accuracy just by being moved with the stepper drives was 25 microns. And then you did hand adjustment to 2 microns. The time for positioning the table to a new position was between 3 and 5 seconds. So it's not, ex not exactly blazing fast, but I guess for a production environment back in the day this was an option. And then we have the Universal Tool and Cutter Grinder Universal Vector Schleifmaschine Deckel S1. That's the machine that I have back in the corner there. 
This was later replaced by the Deckel S11, which is a way more modern design. This is a complete hybrid out of a D-bit grinder and I have no clue what they were thinking here. But you can grind a lot of things on it. And there is again, they, they put a large emphasis on the system, system idea, where you can put all these different heads, slotting head, right angle head, grinding head, boring head, precision boring head, vertical head on all these machines and all these tables and table accessories on the on the face, which is not exactly true for the larger machines because those were bigger and required different accessories. Uh, yeah, there is again the overview over the accessories for the FP machines, vertical milling head, high speed milling head, an angle head, the, the corner head to mill square pockets with a, uh, pockets with an internal square corner, slotting head, precision boring head and the grinding head. And you have all the table accessories like a rotary head, a rotary table, a optical rotary table for the jig borer, uh, different options on vices, the indexing head that you see me use a lot, a rigid table, the extending table and the universal table. And I will not go through the accessories for the copy millers because those are very, very specialized. But uh, here is the mirror image milling accessory or attachment. Yeah, that's that. And there is also specialized equipment for the jig borers, jig grinder machines. For example, you have a slot grinding accessory to do, to grind high precision key slots basically in a bore. This is the Gottes Winter Special Tools Division Spherical Generator, which is in this case set up to turn a 400 millimeter radius. When I took on the job, I didn't realize that the radius on the part I'm making is relatively huge and was just thinking, oh yeah, I can do that with ball turn on the lathe without a problem. And turns out 400 millimeter radius with ball turner gets quite ridiculous because the ball turner needs to be fairly big. So what I came up with is a relatively traditional way of doing it. I have a, a hinge point on the tailstock, it's just in a drill chuck, a bar with two holes, 400 millimeter apart, and I have the tool, the lathe tool has a hinge point in the back too. So the the compound slide can move in the C direction. So the carriage can move in C freely. It's just dragging along. But when I move the cross slide in and out, everything follows this 400 millimeter radius, which is fairly nifty in this case and works extremely well. Um, let, let's, let's do a part and you will see the idea behind it. I have a, a dial test indicator because I can't use the carriage to move in C because the tailstock is locked and there is the bar. So I'm advancing with the, with the tailstock quill and this is my, dig my, my readout for the actual position. I turn on the lathe, I crank the tailstock in until I get a zero reading here and then I engage the power cross feed. Okay, I, I did all the surfacing on a 400 millimeter radius. Now I can retract the tailstock 
and with the tailstock I'm dragging the entire carriage and tool set up back and I can crank the tool back out to my starting uh, position. I'm using a PKD uh, diamond insert, polycrystalline diamond, because it leaves an excellent finish and gives a good preparation for the next step, which is turning with a MKD diamond insert. So this is the finish from the PKD insert. It's, it's really not too shabby. It's very reasonable finish without any polishing. And this is not even cleaned. There is still cutting oil on it. So uh, this is after a rinse with alcohol. So very reasonable finish. And we have a 400 millimeter dished radius in this part now. And the, the facing itself or the ball turning, radius turning is, well, a normal facing operation only that there is an overlaid C motion, which creates the huge radius that we need. When I started this project, I was a little bit curious how I would inspect the radius. As you can see, when we take, when we hold the straight edge up to the part, you can see the very shallow radius that we put into the face of these parts. Uh, the test part in this, this one is scrap. Uh, that's also why it's scratched like crazy. Um, the thing about aluminium is, if it has a very good finish, it scratches basically just by touching it. So the ideal machine to, to inspect this radius would be a contour tracer. Contour tracer basically takes a probe and drags it across the surface in, in one direction and records the corresponding C height depending on where it is. That, that would be, give an exact profile. And from that, you can construct the radius dimension. Another machine would be, of course, a coordinate measuring machine, which would take a probe and just probe a bunch of points on, on the radius surface and generate the true radius that the surface has. Both machines not available to me and fairly expensive. I would like a contour tracer, but they're expensive. So another idea would be to slice the part right down the center line very precisely and put it with its cross section on a optical comparator. I don't have an optical comparator either. So, and also it's a destructive test. So uh, from that point on, then there are different methods where you can inspect the radius on, for example, a CNC mill or on a manual mill using a DRO and dial test indicator. Didn't like that too much either. But what I did like is the spherometer. It's basically a, a depth gauge. And it has a three point support down here. Uh, these three balls are on a pitch circle with a precise known diameter. It means I, I made the space for my depth indicator out of gray cast iron, could be any other metal too, but I had iron at hand and I took a spot drill and I used the bolt circle function of the DRO to drill three holes 
on a 20 millimeter diameter circle. Then I used some uh, acrylic glue to glue in four balls. All this doesn't need to be super precise. The only precise thing needs to be the diameter the holes are uh, the the balls are on the the actual depth the balls are in is not critical because you put this on a known flat surface like a surface plate and you zero it out now it's zeroed out to a flat surface and that way you can measure if something deviates from flat in a spherical manner, hence the name spherometer. The telescope people who build their own telescopes at home and do the mirror grinding and lapping, I think they use very similar devices to check the curvature of their mirrors or lenses. And in CAD, I can construct, I can measure from the three points that these balls generate down to the surface of the mirror. I do that in CAD, I construct uh, some helping lines, some helping geometry, and then I take this, put it on the on my on my mirror, and I get 0 0.126. And when I compare that to my CAD dimension, which is also 0 0.126, well I don't think I'm too far off on my radius geometry. The way I turned the radius introduces a small error since the lathe tool has a radius. If it was that sharp ground with a pointy, pointy uh, tip without any radius, it would be accurate. But with a radius, it falls apart. The, the theoretical error over over the diameter of this mirror is like uh, I think it's less than 10 microns so it should be fine uh, I will wait for the customer feedback of course but should be very fine the the larger the the segment of the of the sphere you're turning with the technique I showed the larger the error gets and also the larger the radius of the tool gets the larger the error gets so there is uh, some things to be considered when you use this technique. For purely aesthetic radius, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer. It works extremely well and also good enough for most things. But this needs a little bit more precision, so I was concerned of checking the radius. So, spherometer, quite a cool instrument. Super simple to make. So, I hope you enjoyed this mix of topics. Thank you all for watching, thanks for the support and I'll be back.